Thank you. Please take your seats. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we ask tonight as we come to look at this issue about what we should be paying to the government, not just money but in other areas as well, we ask that you'll guide our thoughts and our minds carefully, you'll guide my lips carefully. And then what I have to say will come from you. And we'll be challenged about what is the government's, what is humans, but above all, what belongs to you. So be with us, we ask now, and just bless each one of us. Amen. Well, here we are, back with Luke. We had a, an evening off last week, didn't we? This is number 85 in the series on Luke. So I've taken 84 at an average of 40 minutes. And by the way, there is no promise that I'm going to be finished in 40 minutes tonight. Somebody earlier on said to me, will we be out by half past seven? And I said, well, when I wrote the notes originally at Christmas time, it was about six pages. It's now 23 pages long. No, you can't count the pages as I turn them. But So if you take 40 minutes to sermon, 84 sermons, that's 3,360 minutes, which is roughly 56 hours. It was spent in Luke. But we've been travelling through Luke, and every time I've learnt something new. Whether I've been sat in the congregation with you, or whether I've been preparing a sermon. You see, passages which are familiar to us can still have a new message. God brings something different to each one of us. And what I gain from a sermon may not be what you get from the sermon. What my needs are will be different to your needs. So, as we come here tonight... I'm hoping that you're thinking, actually, God's been changing me as we've been going through Luke. And you're looking for him to carry on changing you. Now, you know that I always find it helpful if I'm preaching on something I can actually relate to. And I guess most of us can relate to paying taxes. Probably in this corner here, not quite so much. But you're going to get there. Believe me, your time will come. Daniel Defoe, who wrote Robinson Crusoe, wrote a book in 1726, which was called The Political History of the Devil in which he said this, nothing is certain but death and taxes. Now, most of you are probably more familiar with the Benjamin Franklin, who uh, I think about 1789 used that same phrase. We all know about taxes, and in fact, for me, it's slightly worse than that. Those of you who have known me for many years will know that my first wife was actually a tax officer, and Jackie, before I became a teacher, before she became a teacher, was actually in the VAT office, working with the bailiffs, You can just see her kicking down doors, can't you? Some would say that's natural behaviour for a Portsmouth fan, but I wouldn't want to say that because I've got to go home with her tonight. (laughs) At any rate, back to the sermon. We're on this journey into Jerusalem. Jesus is on his way to the cross. He knows that. We know that with the benefit of hindsight. But the disciples, the people around him, don't know that. So I want us to try and look at this tonight not knowing it from the point of view of the cross, but to imagine that we're there at that time. We're the, those disciples. We're the people in the crowd. What are we going to hear from Jesus? So, as you'll have seen from the outline, I'm, I've, I've got a number of points, five points, the setting, the question, the answer, and the reaction. I need to remember to turn this on, don't I? So, first of all, we're going to start by looking at the setting. Now, I think it's important to always keep the setting. We've broken this into little chapters, little sections as we're preaching. The Bible itself was never originally in chapters and verses in the way we have it. So sometimes we lose the continuity. Luke, as we know, wrote this gospel to try and make sure that it followed through a logical process. So we've had Jesus entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to the cheering of the crowds. But were they expecting the Jesus we think of as the Lord and Saviour? No, they weren't. They were expecting someone who was going to raise up the troops, rally them around, and in a violent way, probably, take over and kick out the Romans. They were looking for a liberator. But Jesus actually was a spiritual liberator, not a physical liberator. And the religious leaders who were around were quite threatened by Jesus. You know, the Pharisees were quite nicely established. They'd got their, their rituals, their rules, their regulations. They were esteemed in the society. They had lots of power. And they didn't want to give it up. No little country rabbi from the backwards of Galilee was going to come in and upset their good life. And so they were ramping up their efforts to get rid of Jesus. Now, should I ask you how much you remember from the sermon three weeks ago, or should I just refresh your memories? I think I'll refresh your memories so I can see your faces from here. 
you remember that they have already tried to trap Jesus. They challenged his authority to cleanse the temple and teach. They said to him, tell us by what authority you're doing these things. Who gave you authority? And in fact, Jesus turned that question around, didn't he? You remember when we listened to the sermon a few weeks back, there was a counter question. He said to them about, is this from man or is this from God? He actually tells this parable, which I think Phil, in his sermon the other week, described as the ultimate insult. Told a parable that was very clearly upsetting it and challenging the Pharisees. Luke had said at the time that the scribes and the Pharisees sought to lay on hands him at that very hour because they'd seen that. And in Luke 19, as we're reminded tonight, the teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he'd told this parable against them. But the reason they couldn't do so, we're told, is because of this fact. They were afraid of the people. You see, at this point, although Jesus hadn't come in as this leader of an army riding up to strike out the Romans, he was still popular with the people. And the Pharisees didn't want to risk their own position. They wanted to risk their prestige and their power. So this is going to bring us to look at this passage tonight. As I said, we're starting at verse 20 in our passage, but it's important to have looked back at what's just happened. So we're going to come to the question. The rulers are scared of the people, but they're even more worried about Jesus, I think. They want to get him arrested, but they don't want to get involved themselves. They don't want to get their hands dirty. They want to keep their distance. So this is what we start with as a reading. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so they might hand him over to the power and authority of the government. Now, I've used the word government here. Depending on which version of the Bible you've got, it may say the, ca- the Roman governor, the governor, the government, the authorities, or indeed the oppressors. So it's quite an interesting situation. They're trying to wash their hands. They don't want to get blamed by the crowds. They want to get into the Roman authorities. But actually, I want to go back to the start of that verse. They sent spies. Now, we in the church, and I'm not talking just about Cow Plain, but any church, need to be wary of people who are coming to church for the wrong reasons. We have people, not actually here, but who come into churches not to seek God, but to try and subvert his purposes and his aims. I'm sure many of you will have listened this week to the debate going around the General Synod about same-sex marriages and the church's stance on it. Churches in the UK are increasingly being targeted to get in line with modern society, to water down what we believe in. Churches in this area and churches further afield have been targeted by civil rights activists who want to get into the church, to become members, to influence the church. You know, we as a church want to see people coming in, people who are genuinely seeking God, people who want to find out more about him, people who want to consider becoming Christians, people who just don't know anything about him. And we really want to welcome those people. But at the same time, we need to be very careful about people who try to come in for the wrong reason. And I would urge you all to pray for the leadership of the church, the elders and the deacons, that God will give us that spirit of discernment that if somebody was to walk through that door, somebody who wanted to cause trouble, someone who was here for the wrong reasons, that A, we'd spot it, and B, that we'd better find God's will in the right way to deal with it. Because I'm aware of churches, and I was researching this when I was doing this, who have banned people from the church, who have kicked people out from, you know, in front, in public. But actually, these people also need God. You know, it's a difficult line, isn't it? We need wisdom. So when people come in, yes, please make them very welcome. (coughs) Please show what God means. But just pray that we'll always be looking out for those spies, those troublemakers who might be coming into our midst. I also want to be quite clear that we always welcome people into the church regardless of their situation and circumstances. The, The phrase I guess many of us will have grown up is, 
love the sinner, but don't love the sin. You know, and that's a really important truth to hold. We're about to embark upon this campaign. We're talking about going out to, to reach people who are non-Christians. That means that people will be coming into this church who don't necessarily, uh, have not necessarily been brought up in the way we've been brought up, don't follow the same rules and regulations, don't understand the way we do things. They may be coming with baggage that we perhaps would find uncomfortable. We still love them. We still want them in the church. We still want to be praying for them to come to faith. So it's important we don't judge people on their situations, but we love people because God loves them. At any rate, a bit of a soapbox there. We're going to go back to the passage now. So they started off like this in their question. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. What a bunch of creeps, eh? This statement was pure flattery. You know, it's human nature to want to soften people up before you ask them for something. This morning I was standing at the door and Bex kindly bought me my second bit of fruitcake. You're right, Bex. Jackie did look up at that point. You said she was going to. (laughs) And as she was walking away, somebody said to me, oh, yes, what's she after? Actually, she was after nothing. She just knows that I like fruitcake and wasn't aware I'd had one. It had been rude for me to have refused a second piece. (laughs) It's fruitcake, Jackie, it's healthy. Uh, It's also surprising after a junior member of my staff will turn up with a cup of tea and a biscuit when they want something. Normally it's because they want to leave early or they've got a bit of a problem uh, and we deal with it, it goes away quite quickly. I do recall the day somebody turned up with a cake, a cup of tea, and mentioned casually as they were about to leave my desk that it overpaid somebody by two and a half million pounds. Um, That one remains in my memory for a while. But you see, because that's human nature. You try to soften the blow, don't you? You try to make things nice and easy. But it's not God's way. Kent Hughes, the commentator, said this. Their strategy was perfumed with flattery. Now, flattery is the reverse of gossip. Gossip is saying behind a person's back what you would never say to their face. But flattery is saying to a person's face what you would never say behind their back. I'll repeat that because I think there's quite an important distinction there. Gossip is saying behind a person's back what you would never say to their face. Flattery is saying to a person's face what you would never say behind their back. I think that's an interesting distinction. Certainly when I read that Christmas time, it made me stop and think about it for a bit. So at any rate, the spies are flattering Jesus because they wanted to set him up for their trap. They want to soften him up. But Jesus was fully aware of the dangers. There are lots of scriptures that talk about this, so here's just three to think about. A lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. That's from Proverbs. Then again in Proverbs, whoever flatters his neighbour is spreading a net for his own feet. Think about that. Often you flatter someone, and actually you end up getting yourself into a trouble. You get yourself caught. This one's possibly slightly harsher. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips. So Jesus was ready for the spies when they asked him their question. Now, to remind you earlier on about the previous question posed in the attempt to trap Jesus. And Jesus forced them to answer then whether John's baptism was authorised by God or it was self-appointed. And you'll remember back at the beginning of Luke 20, the religious rulers end up discussing it with each other, saying, if we say from heaven, he'll say, why do you not believe him? But if we say that John was a prophet, sorry, from man, all the people will stone us to death because they're convinced that John was a prophet. So the question that they'd asked at that point, Jesus could come back with his question and leave them with a quandary about how to answer it. And you'll recall that they actually didn't answer the question. They went away. But by this time, they've learned something. You've got to give them some credit for this point, I guess. They decided the question that the spies should pose to Jesus should be answered only in one of two ways, just like the one that Jesus gave them. And their question was this. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now again, depending which version of the Bible you're looking at, it doesn't actually say whether it's right. It says, is it lawful? Now, I'm guessing that tax, as I said earlier on, is something we all have views on. Um, 
Most of us end up paying tax. Sometimes it's a little bit, sometimes it's a lot. There's different kinds of tax. There's fuel tax, there's income tax. And it's something that's um, really occupied the minds of many people over the years. Here's some quotes to do with tax. Albert Einstein, the harder thing to understand in the world is the income tax. Now, you remember the income tax actually in this country was introduced as a temporary measure to help pay for the Napoleonic Wars. I'd like to think they've been paid for by now, but hey, there we go. Or perhaps this one is one you like more. A fine is a tax for doing wrong. A tax is a fine for doing well. Well, this is my particular favourite. You may did think about it for a while. Everyone I've asked this question of hasn't understood it. So tell me how you get on. What's the difference between a taxidermist and a tax collector? The taxidermist only takes your skin. Yeah, about half of you have got it. Okay, well... <laughs> but the Jews were no different to us, you know. They didn't like giving their money that they'd earned to other people. But also, there was a spiritual, a religious significance to this. Where were the Jews? They were in the land of Israel. Who gave them Israel? God. And they believed that they did not have to pay anything to anybody outside of the Jews. The Romans were foreign occupiers, but the Jews were living in a land given to them by God. So why should they pay anything else? The Romans had a large range of taxes. Income tax, land tax, import taxes, transport taxes. But the most hated tax was the poll tax that everyone paid for living under Rome's authority. Now, again, if you go to a different version of the Bible, it may well be called a tribute tax. But they found it especially offensive because it suggests that Caesar, and Rome in fact, owned them. But they knew that they were God's possession, not anything else. And in fact, if you go down into history, if you look at the rebellion led by Judas uh, of Galilee, AD 6-7, and the Jewish revolt of 66-70, to it's all about tax. That's what started it off. That was the spark that lit the tinderbox. You know, people go to quite amazing lengths to avoid tax. They go offshore, they do all kinds of things. I mean, Sam and Laura yesterday have headed for the married person's allowance. But a tribute to Caesar was considered particularly offensive because it was a payment made by people of one nation to another. It was a symbol of submission and dependence. And for the Jews, their allegiance was to God, not to Roman authorities. So this question that was asked is culturally significant as well as having a spiritual element. Now I said that they'd been clever, they'd, they'd asked this question in a way that could possibly trap Jesus. And that's for two reasons. You see, if Jesus told the people to go ahead and pay the tax, those popular Jews that liked him, that loved him, that were supporting him, could consider him a traitor to the cause of his people. Remember, as I said earlier on, they're expecting a Messiah who's going to come in Lead the Jewish people out of this slavery, out of this being oppressed. They're expecting a fighting leader who's going to lead them out. Not one who's going to kowtow to the Romans, not one who's going to support them. Jesus could lose his popular following and that would be the end of his influence. At least, that's what the Pharisees were hoping. However, on the converse, if Jesus told the people not to pay the tax he would be guilty of going against the Roman government. Then they could haul him in front of the governor and accuse him of being an insurrectionist. And in fact, falsely, this is something they tried later on. We're going to come in due course, I'm not quite sure when, to Luke 23. And this is what the chief priest said then to the governor. He, Jesus, opposes payment of taxes to Caesar. But as we're going to see as we go through this passage, that actually isn't true. But you see, if there's one thing the Romans didn't really like, the one thing they refused to tolerate, it was any kind of rebellion. A man who told people not to pay their taxes would be swiftly arrested and normally killed. The Romans were pretty harsh in the way they ruled the lands they occupied. Their law was pretty swift and pretty violent as far as we're concerned. 
So these chief priests, these spies that were on their behalf, must have thought they'd finally got Jesus right where they wanted him. He was caught on the horns of a real dilemma. If he told them to pay their taxes, he was finished as a hero. If he told them not to, he was probably a dead man. And that brings us to our third point, the answer. Because, see, Jesus is quite wise to this, and this is what he says. He saw through their duplicity and said to them, show me a denarius. Now, this coin is a Roman coin that's equivalent to about a day's wages of common labourer. On one side of the coin, it had the head of Caesar, and the Romans had insisted that any tax that was paid to them was paid in Roman coinage. Now, I want to stop here for a minute, because if you read a lot of commentaries, you'll find that they say, you can tell how poor Jesus was at this point, he had to ask to borrow a coin. You can tell how much in poverty he and the disciples were living. I don't think it's right, and to be honest, I don't think it's relevant. Because I think the point here isn't about whether Jesus had a coin. He wanted them to produce a coin that they were using for their daily business. And then he goes on to ask them this question. Whose portrait and inscription are on it? Now that's a fairly straightforward, easy to answer question, because you just look at the coin, and on it, they're Caesar's, they replied. Now, they probably weren't that keen to, have, to say Caesar's name, but they did. And then we get to what appears to be a nice, simple, straightforward answer, doesn't it? Jesus replies this way. Then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. So he hasn't given them a straightforward yes or no answer. He's come back with a two-part answer. So render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So in the ancient world, coins were understood to be the property of the person whose picture were on them. So who could object to giving Caesar what was already his? Now, it's been argued that this actually is the single most influential political statement ever made. It's been very divisive, it's been quite decisive, and it's determined a lot of shaping the Western civilization. Paul talks about it in Romans 13. And this is where we get into the interesting part of this sermon. Up to now, we've been rattling along quite nicely, thinking about coinage and tax. But we're actually going to get into some more difficult areas. Because you see, what Jesus is saying is that a human government, like it or not, is valid. Even when it's controlled by a leader who thinks he is God. Not only is a secular government valid, but it can also make legitimate claims on the people who it rules over. So in Romans 13, Paul writes this. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Now those of you who come to the prayer meetings when I'm leading, you will know that I always like us to pray for the people over us, be it the government, the royal family, the local councillors. These people have been put there by God. We need to give them the respect that they deserve. Paul goes on in Romans 13, in verse 6, to say this. This is why you also pay taxes for the authorities of God's servant who give their full time to governing. Well, that's probably a little bit more debatable about whether it's full time governing, looking at the MPs and people, but the principle's there, isn't it? That's why we pay for them, so they can be supported and carry out the work. So there are a number of areas where we need to be rendering to Caesar what is Caesar's. So we must pay our taxes. That's what we've been told. So Jesus has just said to us, it's not only lawful, it's, obli- ob- it's compulsory. So render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And note this was not a government that was elected by the people. This was the Roman government, but the Jews still had to pay them their taxes. Paul says this in Romans 13. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. It's quite easy, isn't it, to pay your taxes and think that's it, finished. 
Respect? Respect our politicians? Do you respect them? Do you respect your councillors when you meet them? Do you respect the people that are governing over you? Do you give them the honour that they're due? Quite a challenge there, isn't it? Secondly, we render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's by praying for our leaders. Paul, again in 1 Timothy, writes this. I urge therefore that requests, prayers and intercession be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority. This is good and pleases God our Saviour. Again, I say to you, how often do you pray for the people who are ruling over this country? The people who are ruling over the world? And the third thing I think we're asked to render unto Caesar is our active participation in the government. We can't just sit back and complain about them if we're not actually trying to influence them and take part in them. When you have the opportunity to talk to a councillor when they knock on the door, or an MP, what do you talk to them about? Do you try and influence them on things that are Christian, things that are from God? Or do you just say, oh, thank you, goodbye, I'll read your leaflet later? Do you actually vote? I'm surprised by how many people say, oh, I don't bother to vote. <coughs> we can't, in my opinion, sit back and complain about our government and about our politicians if we don't do anything about it. If we don't take part in the process, we can't complain at the outcome. For some, you may be asked to sit on a jury. For some, you may be asked to go and take part in council forums, sessions where they discuss what's going on in your area. For some of you, it might be serving in a public office. For some, it might be in the military. We're asked to support our government in every way we can. I repeat again, just paying your taxes isn't enough. But I would say that the counter to that is that there are limits to the authority of the government. We must resist the government when we're asked to violate a command of God. Now, the example I want to use of that is found in Acts. The authorities arrested the disciples for preaching, some of them before the Sanhedrin, and they're really worried about what's being said in the name of Jesus. This is causing disruption. So they say to each other, to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. That's the name of Jesus. So they call the disciples in, they say this. They called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Those of you who get your evangelicals now will have seen that there's an item in there about a street pastor who has just been to court for saying what he believed the Bible taught. We may think that this situation existed a long time ago, but I think it's increasingly coming up in this country. We should be praying about it and we should be bold really to stand up for what we believe and to talk about it. Now I have to say, unsurprisingly, it's Peter in this situation we're looking at, and as we know, Peter was always known for his tact and diplomacy and obedience to authority. Because no sooner were the disciples released than they went right back to preaching and were arrested again. So they were called back in, stood there in front of the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. So I'm saying we should respect the government and politicians. We should respect the law. But there will come a point, there will come a situation when God has to overrule. In what we're talking about to do with Islam last week, some of the things that are being spoken about there, where our country is headed, that situation might not be as far away as perhaps many of us would like it to be. You know, when uh, she was standing up here talking about raising people up who prepare to die for their faith in the UK. That's quite a sobering thought for many of us, isn't it? But our duty is always to put God first. Because you see, that's the second part of the answer, isn't it? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. Now to me, this is a truly profound statement. Because what is it that belongs to God? Well, let's start with Genesis, shall we? The principle was that on a coin that had an image of Caesar on it, that belonged to Caesar's because it had Caesar's image. 
So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female, he created them. So this includes absolutely everything. Our bodies belong to God. Our eyes, our ears, our hands. They're instruments for us to use in his service. As we see the needs around us, as we listen to his voice, as we reach out with the compassion of Christ to reach the unsaved, we need to remember that everything we have, every gift he's given us, is from God. Our homes, they belong to God. They're places that God has set apart for us to rest in his goodness, but also to use for hospitality, to invite people in. It might be people from the church, it might be outsiders, it might be your neighbours. It might be, I don't know, the bus committee meeting. It might be whatever group you belong to. They come into your house. They see, I hope, a Christian home. What influence is that having on them? Our time belongs to God. Now that's an interesting one, isn't it, at times? It's the most precious resource we have. It's one of those things you can't sort of slip a few bits and add a bit here. We're fixed. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It doesn't really change. I know there's the odd second that creeps in every 20 years or so, but, you know, we're not really going to gain any extra time. Are we using it wisely? Are we using it for God? And that's not just time when you're in this building or out doing what is more obviously Christian work. Are you using it for God when you're in school, when you're in college, when you're at work? When you're here at coffee shop, are you sitting down having a, a nice informal chat or are you looking for that opportunity to use to talk to a non-Christian, a visitor, someone who's not here on a Sunday about the love of God? The coffee shop is really great. Tier 3 is really great. The kids' work that we do, fantastic. But actually, they're all about reaching people for Christ. You know, our work belongs to God. It's the service we offer him. Our money belongs to God. Yes, it's to be used wisely, but it's given to us in trust. But actually, we should be looking to invest it in the kingdom of God. It all belongs to God. Yes, it does. Everything belongs to God. Now, I also want to be slightly controversial here and talk about the difference between the church and the work of God. See, there are lots of people, and I come across them, in my work situation, who would never dream of going anywhere near a church. But they send a regular donation to the church. Or I find that in America, for instance, people can pay their membership to the church, but they may not have actually been to the church for 10 or 20 years. See, it's not just enough to pay your money into the church and think that's it done. God is expecting us to think about what it is he wants us to do and to be involved with. It's not just enough to give your tithe to a local church and think that that is it. God also expects us to think about his work outside of the church fellowship you're in, to pray for those in the community, to pray and support missionary workers who are both in this country and overseas. You know, there's a tremendous work going on in Manchester and in Birmingham and in London with people from other countries who are coming into our country. Needs prayer, needs support. We should be praying for governments, not only of this country, but for other countries. Um, One might suspect that America could do with a bit of prayer at the moment. Just thinking and supporting Cow Plain Church isn't enough. What God's looking for is people who support his work overall, not just the church. So, that was his answer. What a profound answer. Yes, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, but everything else. Everything you do, everything you think about, all your time, your money, your gifts, your talents, your home, is his. So it should go to God. So, we come to point four. Their reaction. They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public, and astonished by his answer, they became silent. I suppose that's not really surprising. It's a bit difficult to take on an argument with God and win, isn't it? You can't try and banter with God. You can't try and match your wits with him. But I wonder, how often has God 
done something in your life or come back with an answer that's left you speechless? Have you actually ever found yourself lost for words when God acts? Sometimes I find that as I look back at my life, and I have to be honest because I'm quite stubborn, very stubborn, very, very stubborn, very, very stubborn, I'm not very good at taking guidance at the time. But I can look back over the years and I can see where God has been leading me. And I've got to be honest, if he'd actually said to me at the time what he was going to do, where I was going to go, what I was going to do, what I was going to say, where I was going to meet people, I probably wouldn't have accepted it. When I look back and see the changes that God has done in my life, and other people I know as well, I find myself lost for words to describe them. There are things that you can't put into the English language, or the French language, or the Spanish language, or any other language. There are things that God does which are indescribable. We have a fantastic God, a wonderful God. And we worry about paying taxes and supporting people. Think how much God has given us. So, you know, as I come to the end of a sermon, I normally like to try and find some ways that we can apply things. Because, as we were told this morning about enthusiasm, it's no good just thinking about it. You've actually got to put it into practice. So here's my thoughts as I came to the end of this one. Be ready to be questioned. How ready are you when someone tomorrow morning at work, school, college, wherever you are, walks up to you and says... This Jesus business, don't you just take all your money? Don't you have to pay everything into the church, don't get any money back? Are you ready to answer? Can you turn that round and use it? Now, Jackie this morning was teaching in Sunday Club, and one of the things she was doing was to take a glass of water, put a mat on it, turn it upside down, take your hand away, and the suction held the mat there. It worked really well the first time. <laughs> However, those of you who got kids in Sunday Club will know it didn't work quite so well the following times. But she was able to use that and talk about Peter when he got out of the boat and started to walk on the water. You know, when his eyes were fixed upon Jesus, he was going strong. When his eyes drifted, when he looked down at the water, he fell into the water. The only way you're going to be ready to answer a question is if your mind, your eyes, your thoughts are fixed on him. If you know his word. If you've actually thought about the answers, the, the questions you might get asked. I've said before that... Um, some years ago, when I was talking over coffee at work, one of the young lads, sorry, young lads, 23, um, said to me, well, this Jesus at Easter, he's not the same Jesus at Christmas time, is he? <laughs> Didn't know. 23 years old. They hadn't been taught that. And I actually found myself floundering for a minute or two about how to actually answer that question. I've thought about it since, and I've thought about some of the other questions I could be asked. Last week, again, when we were talking about Islam, there was a comment made that Muslim children are taught to debate, taught to debate their religion. How ready are you to debate Christianity, to answer, stand up for your faith? Are you walking close enough with God that you can actually give an answer when you're questioned? So, give to the government. What is the government's? So, as I said before, it's not just paying taxes. It's supporting that democratic process. We often complain about the government. We say it's not Christian enough. They're not doing the right things. Did you check to see if there's a Christian candidate in the last elections locally that you could have voted for? Do you actually know who the Christians are who are in Parliament? Do you pray for them? Do you ask God to raise up more Christian politicians? I'm going to look slightly to the left here. Have you ever thought about being a Christian in Parliament, going into that business, becoming a politician? As I said before, you can't just mock the government, complain about it, if you're not prepared to take part in it. Give to God what is God's. <laughs> it's your talent, your gift, your time, your commitment. You know, it's really easy on a Sunday night, perhaps, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, um, to sort of think it's a bit cold, it's a bit wet, there's something on television I want to watch, I need to be away by 7.30. You know, um, it's really important to be with God's people, to hear what's being said to have times of fellowship. You need to give to God what is God. Include your commitment in that. You know, re remember, the God who's asking for this is the God who sent his only son to die for you. That you might have eternal life. He's given you everything. Why shouldn't you give that back to him? 
My last one, as I say, is give to the church what is the church. And I put that there really just to remind you that just sitting in a church, just being involved with the local church, isn't everything. There's more to giving to God what is God's. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for everything you've given to us. Lord, we thank you that you give us so much in this country. Lord, we have homes, we have food, we have employment. Lord, we have a government over us that we can influence. And Lord, we want to thank you for that. We want to be wise about how we use the things you've given us, be it our homes, be it our money, be it where we work. Lord, we want to use it for your glory and for your purposes. But above all, Lord, we want to thank you for that gift that you gave us, that gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came down to die so that we might have eternal life. Father, we thank you for that. And Lord, we just ask that you challenge each one of us to think about how we use our talents, our gifts, our time, everything in this world, for your glory and for your purposes. Amen.